Did everybody get a chance to get some food or some coffee or tea? Or like me, I got some hot water. Um, um, so we're what a, what a great to see everybody today and to fill all the tables in the in the state room. Someone came in earlier and was like, ah, it's intimidating in here. Um, well, let's let's reclaim the room as being grand and um, special, but not intimidating. Um, so my name is Maddie Fox. And um, I am on faculty here at Brooklyn College um, and part of the Brooklyn College Listening Project, which we'll hear more about in a moment. Um, I'm in Children and Youth Studies and Sociology. Um, and welcome to this storytelling brunch. We're here today to share some stories um, and to talk about story, um, and especially the practice of listening to and honoring, considering, documenting, archiving, archiving other stories. Um, so, and some students are going to be sharing their work, um, but we're also looking forward to this um, brunch being engaged and participatory um, for all of us. Um, and so, to begin and to kind of um, set the tone for that, for that, for it being kind of a participatory session today, um, I want to, us to begin with some introductions to each other. So if you could turn to one person near you, maybe hopefully someone you don't know so well, although you are sitting in circles and some of you came with classmates, but um, introduce yourself to one person at your table and share um, one moment from your journey to, uh, from your trip getting here today or some other moment from this morning, okay? So just your name and one moment from your morning so far. Okay. Okay, so find the end to your sentence. Did anybody hear anything um anything remarkable that you feel like you need to share with the room? Anyone have an experience today that we need to hear? Okay, good. Well, that's probably, no news is probably good news. Um, <laughs> um, let's just hear one moment from the day so far, one or two, that you heard in your introductions. W ran for the five train? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Anyone else run for the train today? All right. I hope you made it. <laughs> and one more, something else. Yeah. Uh, well, this is Alan, and uh, he has already taken a midterm today. Woo! Mm. And two trains. Oh. Okay. <laughs> All right. So there's been a lot of energy and calories <laughs> working, and then this room is helping us stay warm and sweaty. Okay, so um, it's a great honor today for all of us to have this opportunity to share stories and think about story together um, with, and especially it's an honor to be here with Edwidge Danticat. Edwidge Danticat, as you all know, is one of the greatest writers in the world. <laughs> She's known for her novels, her short stories, her young adult novels and children's literature, and her nonfiction, including collections of oral history like The Butterfly's Way. She's won awards and recognition from here to the moon and back, um, including the American Book Award, the Story Prize, National Books Critics 
Book, National Book Critics Circle Award, a MacArthur Fellowship, Newstat International Prize for Literature. And this is just a selection to say that this world honors Edwige Danticat. She's a master artist of storytelling, and what a thrill and a joy for all of us to share some stories together today as a room. Students here in the room today are all engaged in listening to stories in various ways, in one form or another. And many of the students in the room have conducted oral histories. Um, we have a campus-wide oral history project called, um, that you're gonna hear more about in a moment from Jessica Siegel called the Brooklyn College Listening Project. And we're also joined by Professor Pardis um, and, and his class. So thanks you, to you all for being here. And Michael Pardis is a core member of the Bronx African American Oral History Project. So we have lots of expertise distributed around the room, as well as we all have stories. I had a slide. It's gone. It's OK. Um, but we all have stories. We all have expertise. Um, so the way this session is going to work this morning is that we're going to um, get a brief introduction to the Broken College Listening Project, and then welcome, come on in. And then um, we're going to hear from four students who each have um, conducted uh, oral histories, um, and um, and then we'll turn to the room and get your thoughts, reactions, questions, um, and then we'll hear um, we'll talk also with Edwidge. Okay, so I'm going to turn it to Jessica now. Thank you, Maddie. One of the greatest things about working with the Brooklyn College Listening Project was all the wonderful people you get to work with, not only the students, but my great fellow faculty members as well. It's just a wonderful project that reaches across departments and schools and things like that. Um, in any case, all of us faculty and students who have been involved with the Brooklyn College Listening Project are excited and honored to share our students' work with Edwidge Dantica, uh, who is who has created in indelible and powerful stories of the people of Haiti and the Haitian diaspora. She works in fiction and nonfiction, memoir and essay, and in each case, as she said yesterday at one of the sessions that I went to, she said, writing stories because of a lacuna, something that was sk skipped or missing. Um, in a sense, that's what the approximately 700 students, that's how many students have been involved in the listening project, um, have been doing in the three years the project has been in existence, helping people who live both ordinary, and I put that in quotes, and heroic lives tell their life stories. Five faculty members, Maddie, Joseph Enton, Miguel Macias, who's sitting next to him, uh, Phil Napoli and I came together to create the Brooklyn College Listening Project in the fall of 2014. Coming from different departments, we all shared a sense that our students at Brooklyn College could be the creators of their own learning. Um, and if they were given oral history skills, could go out into their communities or other communities and help people tell their life stories and give their perspectives on the world. Um, and they have done it in very powerful ways. You're going to hear some of them today. Thanks to all of these students' work in the three years of its ex existence, over 400 oral histories are uh, archived digitally. Um, in that time, 25 to 30 faculty members have been involved with the Brooklyn College Listening Project in classes ranging from American studies to history to sociology, children's studies, music, Puerto Rican and Latino studies, ju uh, Judaic studies, journalism and, t and TV and radio, and the Fierstein School of Cinema Studies, who have been very involved in the project because a lot of the podcasts that appear on the website, ooh, the website, oh, there it is, um, <laughs> are thanks to the Fierstein, the students at the Fierstein School of Cinema Studies. Graduate students who are at the Navy Yard, who were feel far away but be around this project have become very much involved in what we're doing over here. Um, in addition to the ones that you'll hear excerpts of today, if you go to this website, bclisteningproject.org, um, you can hear others. For example, um, Steve Schwerner, who interviewed, uh, was interviewed by Jonathan Gomez and Victoria Manna, talking about the murder of his brother Mickey, along with James Cheney and Andrew Goodman by the Ku Klux Klan in 1963, and how it contributed to his own activism. 
uh, Pedro Batista talking, speaking to Ivana Machuca about what it was like meeting his mother for the first time after growing up in the Dominican Republic after she moved to New York City to help support him. Like you, Edwidge, uh, he was raised by an aunt and uncle before he came to this country. Um, Luisa Russo, interviewed by her daughter Valerie about watching her neighbor neighborhood become enveloped by gentrification so that she can no longer live in the community she grew up in. Um, Jeffrey Werner, interviewed by his sister-in-law, Montana Durieu, about what it was like being both a Haitian American and a black man in America, raising his children to be proud of who they are. And Carlos, uh, an undocumented immigrant, interviewed by Israel Salas Rodriguez, who through his words, though not his voice, um, we learn about what it's like to live in the shadows. And Israel and Jasmine, who you're gonna hear from later, and uh, Leah Shaw, fr Shaw from Fierstein put together a podcast without his voice, but using his words. Um, these are some of the people's stories that helped to fill in our understandings of communities in Brooklyn and New York and enable the rest of us to meet these remarkable people. Uh, you'll have a chance to hear some of them as Dominic, Jasmine, Radhika, and Zoe will share with you the people they helped tell their stories. Um, okay, so we're going to turn it now over to the students. Um, so um, Radhika Vishwanathan will, is going to tell us about an interview she did with an Indian dancer. Dominic Braswell um, is going to share a slice of an interview he did with an educator and organizer here in New York City. Um, Zoe Wolf is going to share a bit about her interview with a young transgender woman who immigrated from the Philippines. And Jasmine Toledo will share with us a bit about her interview with a DACA recipient from Mexico. So it's a dazzling array of stories. We're going to be taken all over and considering all kinds of different contexts and situations, um, but um, grounded in people's real lives and stories. So let's begin with Radhika. Hi, my name is Radhika, um, and I interviewed Preeti Vasudevan, who is a Bharatanatyam. She started off as a Bharatanatyam dancer in India, but she traveled around the world, and now she works in New York. Um, and this was an assignment for Professor Siegel's uh, seminar class, where we studied immigrant. And, Im and this, art, uh, this assignment was to interview an immigrant artist um, and write a profile about them. So I immediately knew that I wanted to interview a dancer because I've been dancing for as long as I can remember. Um, and I've specifically been doing Indian classical dance. Um, so I like looked online to find um, an Indian classical dancer in New York City who was an immigrant. Um, and I found Preeti Vasudevan's website. I emailed her and we met up at a restaurant in Chelsea, where, which is where she lives. Um, and we spoke for about an hour and within that hour, um, I, we went from being like complete strangers to me knowing some very personal and intimate details about her life. So Preeti was born in India and started learning Bharatanatyam, um, the same type of Indian classical dance that I learned. But she quickly became interested in other forms of dance. So she traveled the world studying dance in London, Paris, Japan, and beyond in order to cultivate her unique and deeply personal dancing style. Finally landing in New York in 2006, she established a performing arts company called Thresh. The company is focused on creating dance theater productions that combine Preeti's knowledge of both classical and modern dance. Despite being established as a modern dancer in New York City, Preeti imbues her dance with memories of her childhood, Bharatanatyam techniques, and the values she learned growing up in India. As with all immigrant artists, it's impossible to separate Preeti's art from her background and life experiences. I selected a few excerpts from the interview. Um, it was like an hour long interview, and this is just two minutes of it, um, that provide a well-rounded view of Preeti's life and passion. Um, it starts off with her childhood in India when she first started dancing, um, then moves on to like the reason she dances and what she feels when she dances. I've always 
super interested in dancing. Uh, I was never interested only in Bharatanatyam. Um, so from from my childhood, I've been very interested in dancing period. Yeah. So when I wasn't doing Bharatanatyam classes, I'd come and watch uh, Gene Kelly and Faris Sehru chat dance. Yeah, I love that. Uh, I loved um, all the Broadway musicals. Um, I mean, I knew all the dancers in Fiddler on the Roof, for instance. I love performing. I mean, you know, I feel I feel totally myself when I'm on stage. It's my home. I've grown up in it. But I love becoming a choreographer. Because it's like, you know, it's like a puppet and a puppeteer. There's a, there's a very deep connection there of the souls. That if you're creating, there is something you're molding to become. And watching it outside yourself and letting it breathe by itself is a completely, uh, uh, it's not just a unique experience, but I think it's a, uh, one is humbled by it. One feels honored that you can do it. I feel nervous. I feel uh, exhilarated. Uh, I feel this is what I'm meant to do. I feel if I don't do this, I don't know what else I will do. I feel, um, I really feel that I'm meant to communicate with the audience and um, I'm able to say things that I can't say outside of the stage. I've always been interested in dancing. Uh, I was never interested only in Bharatanatyam. Um, so from from my childhood, I've been very interested in... Sorry, that's it. Um, so yeah, that's a little excerpt from my interview with Preeti and it was really great getting to know her and like learn her story and everything. Um, so yeah, I'm happy I was able to have that opportunity. Thanks. So um, Dominic is going to be next, and as you're listening, um, we're going to save questions um, and comments and discussion for the end of all four students. But as you're listening, be thinking about the process of what it means to hear someone else's story or to like take in or make a product even from someone else's story or the ethics um, or the context um, or um, um, the, the kind of, um, the, yeah, the process of, of, of conducting these interviews um, and be ready, right, with some questions at the end or some comments or provocations. Um, and um, so we'll turn it over to Dominic and I'll try and Hello. Um, again, my name is Dominic Braswell. I'm a senior. Uh, I'm working in May, so shout out to me. Um, uh, Africana Studies major, American Studies minor. Um, I want to start off, start off first by speaking about um, the importance of, of oral histories. Um, you know, I think oral histories, um, you know, they give us um, a telling of, you know, past events and moments um, do the voices of those who are directly or indirectly um, affected by these, um, you know, historical events and moments, which we don't, which we don't get from traditional kind of academic tellings of, of history, which is kind of usually uh, top down um, and detached. Not to say that every historian is detached from, um, you know, uh, these moments that they're that they're studying, but it's usually um, kind of a top down, detached. Um, studying examination of the past. Um, and I think oral histories provide um, uh, more of a nuanced telling of those, those events um, and those moments that we don't get from, um, you know, uh, histor historical texts. And I also think there's just hearing these, uh, hearing about these stories and these events from, you know, the voices of people, um, you know, as a, you know, a particular tone, uh, texture and uh, flavor to these histories that you don't particularly get just from kind of reading, uh, uh, you know, uh, the written uh, ri written text. Um, so, which brings me to my um, uh, the interview I conducted for uh, the Brooklyn College Listening Project. Um, so, I, I interviewed uh, a self-described Dominican American by the name of um, Mark Torres. He's a high school a high school teacher and. Um, community organizer here in here in New York City. He's actually the chair of chair of an organization I'm a part of called uh, the People Power Movement. Um, so um, in this clip, that I'm going to show um, 
you know, due to the interview, Mark, um, you know, speaks about, um, you know, uh, his life here in New York City and how his family came, um, came, uh, came to the states and his views on uh, um, different topics of colonialism and um, capitalism. But in this particular in this particular clip, um, Mark speaking about how his mother came to um, America and uh, through her connection to uh, the Dominican uh, dictator. Uh, uh, Trujillo, um, she knew uh, his his son, and through that connection, um, she was able to come here to America. And I know um, Edwidge um, in her book, um, uh, the um, the farming of bones. Uh, she speaks about uh, the the massacre of uh, of Haitians under the uh, Trujillo dictatorship. So I'm just gonna play this. She is from the Dominican Republic. She was born there. She was born in a small town uh, called Canca La Piedra, which is in the uh, Cibao region, which is like the fertile area of the country. And um, she was born there. And then she had uh, some of our uh, relatives were part of the, the Trujillo dictators, um, you know, like clique. Uh, even though one of my uncles, he, he had to leave the Dominican Republic, he had to go to Puerto Rico because he was against the dictatorship. So, you know, the, the dictatorship really divided families. You know, there were some people who were totally against the dictatorship and there were other people who wanted to get the benefits of the dictatorship. Was it a divide? Was it a divide in your family? Uh, yeah, it was a divide in my family. And my mother actually, she got to hang out with, like, Trujillo's son, Ramfis. You know, because he was a real party animal, and my mother was young and nice looking and thin and whatever, so she used to run with them. And so, part of that family connection with the dictatorship got her a visa to come to the United States. It was in the 1950s. So she came here in the 1950s, and here she met my father, who was from another part of the Cibao called San Jose de la Mata, which is a more rural area, and uh, up like in the mountains and shit. And, uh, yeah, so that was uh, yeah, that was a clip. So um, I just want to lastly say, um, you know, I think kind of um, that clip kind of reflects um, kind of that nuance and that tone um, that I was speaking about in terms of um, you know what oral histories give us, and compared to um, kind of um, written history. And I just want to um, lastly say um, how important, how powerful I think oral histories are, particularly to marginalized um, groups and marginalized communities, because um, I you know I, Edwidge. Um, um, how she came came to write her book, um, you know, the farming of bones was because kind of the history of the Haitian massacre. She had observed that kind of had been um, forgotten, um, 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 and I think you know, particularly with marginalized communities, there's a way in which because they're voiceless, there's a ways in which that you know a lot of their stories are are forgotten or overlooked. And I think that's why oral histories are imp are are important because it gives voice to um, it, gi it gives voice to these communities. So, thank you. I'm Zoe Wolf. I interviewed a trans woman named Justine. She immigrated from the Philippines when she was eight. Um, wait until I can I have my flicker too? Just so I have a couple slides. I didn't even see that. Did you see it first? Yeah. Um, no, I'll just have to click on it. I can. Oh, that's a, that's a photo that she demanded I use of her. Uh, <laughs> I have opinions about it. Uh, she's a lovely young woman. She is my age. I wanted to interview someone that I thought had had a really interesting experience with America. And she came to the States uh, when she was eight years old. She originally uh, was born in the Philippines. She grew up in Manila, downtown Manila, um, where her father was, uh, her white father was working for a UN refugee agency. And her mother would uh, work for the federal equivalent of what, what would later become Department of Homeland Security. She lived in downtown Manila and it was um, 
sort of in the like the the government district uh, where the um, where the NGO offices were. But her grandmother, her grandmother uh, on her mother's side, obviously was um, a much more rural in the uh, in the Philippines and almost like li living on the beach, basically. Um, although that picture is fake, there is like there is humanity all over this photo. It was just cropped to sort of <laughs> give you a picture of how beautiful that was. Um, when she came to when she came to America when she was eight years old, she had had this opinion from her father from the white side of her family that America essentially was the empire. America was this. Um, it was where the culture was. It was where all the good products were. And she reflected that the Philippines had been sort of um, a, a nation that had pretty much completely adopted the mentality and attitudes of its former colonial oppressors. And so when she came to America, she felt. Um, this strange sense of like, almost like that 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 was going to the mainland, basically. Um, uh, when she was there in her early life, she went to IMSA, which I found really interesting. Um, IMSA is the Illinois Math and Science Academy. It is a, a science-heavy school in Illinois that she said was almost completely filled with second-generation immigrant families, and essentially it's part of. They have like pedagogical experimentation. It's filled with sort of the um, military-industrial complex. These the people that go to IMSA, the children that go to IMSA, are believed to be like um, they hope that those children will be the future leaders of the world. Um, whether or not that's true. Um, she came to New York. She told me not to use that photo because of the duck face, but I think she looks too cute, so I used it anyway. Uh, <laughs> She's very, she's a very modern woman. Like she's basically after that, she is an, she's an ad executive. You know, she, she start her, her twenties, like she said, were about like deconstructing what um, America essentially had told her what her life should be, and she spent her twenties trying to figure out who she wanted to be, and that was like her early life in New York. Um, this is, this is that video is useless, but this is um. Donald, a former lover of hers, he died essentially of HIV. Uh, he didn't die of he didn't die of AIDS, but he died of like the way that HIV can kill a person. And I actually wanted to um, play this now. I had the good fortune after moving to New York of meeting a lot of people who showed me like essentially like other ways to be like happy. Like people that I admired. Like I found other role models in New York. What was striking to me about some of those role models, uh, the queer ones, um, was that a lot of their self-concept had been built uh, from these ashes. Like... What? Well, like, of course, like, these are New Yorkers, these, and many of them were a bit older than me, so, like, many of their friends had died from AIDS in the 80s and 90s, and, um, of course, they had also lost people who had killed themselves or been murdered, um, poor people, that is, yeah. uh, and I admired them because it looked so much harder, and it was ver very much harder to create like a culture and a sense of solidarity out of like this negative thing. You know what I mean? Like, in a way, like I don't think I don't think that one can really renounce their past, but like the happiness of many of these people, I admire them because they were happy, and that happiness, uh, in spite of sh their shitty families and growing up in like shitty like homophobic small town America this was the flip side of the well I think that there were things about them that were very American like Donald for example was um, he had like a democratic streak in the sense that he didn't like to see people uh, be elevated over others um, or even like try to take on that like I would, I would often go to dinner with him, and I like I remember a few times. Like I, I went to dinner with him once, um, and he, his, 
we were meeting a friend Nancy who brought like this this gentleman that she was dating at the time. This is Nancy Jo Sale. She has recently written a book about um, women in Facebook or whatever. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, so this guy is like a total creep and like being <laughs> being like a prick to everyone, Nancy included. And Just to sort of like dominate the table. Exactly. Um, and I remember that dinner though, not because of the distinction of this guy's creepness, but like the way in which Donald like punctured him like so patiently and systematically. Um, so that this person was actually who Justine sort of um, was a supporter in her life as she as she like moved through her life and became a real person as a trans woman and was later sort of claimed by HIV. And I, I was really interested in this clip about death specifically because I told her that I was coming to speak here today with Edward Shantika, and um, she mentioned that she had just finished your book, um, The Art of Death. Um, because she claimed, she basically because she's had so much loss in her life, she's sort of, her. it comes out in her, her writing, she's also a fiction writer, that she is sort of obsessed with death. And she, when I mentioned that, that was the thing that she thought would be funny to say. <laughs> Uh, sure I have that in common. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so this is like her life in Brooklyn now, now that she's a, a successful young woman. She, uh, my current job mostly I write think pieces for multinational clients about a slew of topics and such, and you see this language, so dense, such entities care about like consumer trends, how technology is affecting supply chain issues, the vagaries of localized marketing and digital age, etc. She hates her job, by the way, you can't tell from that paragraph. Uh, she's a fiction writer. She wrote some of the best fiction I've ever read. Honestly, it is so tender. Um, I hope someday that they that she gets a novel out there. Um, and she knows how to make a good Spotify playlist. <laughs> there, that's just the ending much. Okay, so today um, I'm going to be presenting you a clip okay, of... Okay, so my name is Jasmine. That one's okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to be presenting you a clip of um, a much larger piece that I did with Professor Wills from the History Department. We worked on, um, it ended up becoming my bachelor's thesis, but it was a project where I interviewed many undocumented Latinos um, who came here from Latin America and was looking for work, was looking to obtain the American dream. And I was really interested in that because my family migrated here from Puerto Rico. And um, I can relate to a lot of these people through a lot of the jobs that they were pushed into, such as the service industry or the domestic workforce. I'm a nanny. And um, so I really wanted to explore their lives, but more of the working part of it. Like, what is it like to work in the United States, to work in New York City as an undocumented person? And um, while I was listening to Dominic and how he was saying how oral history gives, like, this, instead of the top-down approach, you get to hear from the people instead of historians talking about it. And one thing that I realized while I was doing the research for this project is that there's so many good articles and books on people coming from Latin America, on people... Um, undocumented people, their their lives and their work experiences, but what's missing from every piece is their voices. I wasn't able to get a sense of their story, them telling their own story. And so I really love doing these interviews because I got to hear from the people instead of from the historians. So the person that we're going to hear from today is a woman who came here from uh, Mexico. And she is undocumented, and she was a DACA recipient. And she's going to be talking about her working as a domestic worker and a mother. Uh, did we move the card? Yeah, no, that's okay. I'll get the hands down. Okay. Um, I started my nanny job 
the, the baby that is now almost four wasn't even born. Mm -hmm. So I got to see him be born and raise him as my own mm -hmm. there in the English-speaking family. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I know how to speak Spanish, I taught Spanish to the baby. And he is now three and a half and he speaks he speaks some Spanish, but he understands it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I want to say he loves me. Mm -hmm. He misses me when I'm not around. Um, sometimes he wants to call me mom. I mm -hmm. tell him that I'm not his mom, that I'm his friend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Um, um, but um, but he says it like sometimes as a joke, and and mm -hmm. and he knows that. It doesn't bother me, but the fact that he should know that I'm not yeah. his mother and I'm just his family. Yeah. Um, do you ever feel like guilty or some type of way about your kids? Of course, all the time, especially Mondays. Why? Mm -hmm. Because the weekend I'm with them. Mm -hmm. So it's like Friday, Saturday, Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday I'm with them. And we're always doing some fun things, you mm -hmm. know, going to the playground, the weather science museums, movies, and then when they come, and I know they're in school, but the fact that I'm with other kids that are not mine, yeah, yeah, but I do, I do feel very guilty, really. Okay, so like I said, this piece was part of a much larger project that I did, but I chose to present this this clip to you because I feel like although she is undocumented and from Mexico there's so many things that many of us can relate to from this piece there's so many commonalities that I share with her and that I'm sure many of you share with her so one of the things that she mentions is that she feels a part of their family and this is something that a lot of undocumented well, a lot of domestic workers feel when they gain attachment towards the their employers I mean, they're there every day in their household. Their employers letting them in their house. Like, they're sharing their secrets, their dirty laundry, figuratively and literally. You're picking up their dirty laundry. And, um, and so you almost feel like you're a part of the family. But what the worker doesn't usually take into account is that there's a power struggle every day. Every day your employer is watching you, watching your every step, you're raising their children. And so what employers, what employees also don't take into account is the fact that you feel like you're a part of the family, but what happens when those kids get older? What happens, people pass away, people move. And so a lot of the times these employees feel um, betrayed when that relationship ends. And so this woman is actually a part of my life. She's my friend. And so I, she talks about this story all the time and being a part of the family. And I always think into my head, well, what's going to happen when these kids go to school full time? You know, and so that are, that's a lot of the things that domestic workers have to think about. Although we feel a part of the family, there's really no security there. Um, another thing that I feel like as a domestic worker that um, we can relate to this woman is that those kids feel like her children. She raises them. They take a part of her culture, her language. She brings them into her community. And so she really does feel like um, they're her kids and that, that they are a part of her family too. And um, all nannies and caregivers can relate to that. And something that I cannot relate to, but that I'm sure many women in here or in general can relate to, is that she's a mom. She leaves her children every day to go take care of other children. And um, although she loves being a mom and she loves working, it's kind of something that's something that gives you satisfaction and a guilt at the same time. And so I chose this piece to share to you all because there's so much that we can relate to to this woman. Even though she's undocumented, she's a DACA recipient, and we don't know what it's like to live that life, there's many things that we can relate to her. There's many commonalities that we do share with her. And so thank you for listening to her story. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Um, so... Um, uh, we heard so much about all different textures and um, 
tones, topics, geographies. Um, and so at your tables, let's take a minute to just share um, anything that resonates with you or that struck you. Um, a lot of you have conducted your own oral histories, so maybe um, uh, if there's something that you heard that connects with stories you've heard. Um, but just take a moment at your tables to talk about um, whatever stood out for you in hearing across these four oral histories. And then we're going to share out to the whole room so some things. So we'll discuss as a whole room, so be ready for that. Who has a, a thought to share out to the whole room or a question from one of the um, students who shared their work today? A deep thought you had at your table or a question for presenter or for the room? Maybe you should share your book. Yeah, exactly. Um, so my thought or question was actually for you. I really loved your project on um, on the dance and and the woman that you interviewed. I felt like that clip that you shared, it was so poetic the way that she described dance and like it was really relatable because I actually got into know more about my culture through Latin dance mm -hmm. and I love it so so much. Like I love the music and the dance and I, like just every, I go so far back into learning about my people's music, like I try to like listen to like salsa from like the 50s, 60s, 70s and how it changed and it really helped me to get to know my culture and as I dance that music it does almost feel like a privilege because the woman that you interviewed said that like it feels like she feels privileged to dance that music and that's exactly how I feel like when I dance to Latin dance, like I feel like this is like a privilege to me, like I'm taking a part of the culture, like now I'm actually a part of it. And so my question is, do you get to learn more about your own culture through dance? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, definitely. So um, the type of dance that I learn is uh, like Indian classical. So it's like ancient, it's an ancient form of um, dance that is like, like hundreds of years old. And so, and a lot of it is like Indian, well, Hindu mythology and, um, Although I'm not like, I don't really like practice as a, like religiously, um, it's like still like the story of the people from where, of like my ancestors and what they value. And, um, and so I, I loved like growing up as a dancer because it made me closer to like my grandparents and it made me um, like appreciate what they valued. And, and, and so yeah, 100%. And I, I totally feel like exactly what you were saying. Um, it like I would have never known about like, traditional Indian music um, and like all of those things that are really really important to my family without being a dancer and this specific type of dancing so yeah uh, th that's like one of the most important parts of my childhood was like growing up as a dancer um, my question is for the person who you just seen you did mention that she was a trans woman. Like she yeah, she's trans a trans woman like me. Um, she's much shorter though. <laughs> <laughs> um, during your interview, I know like you know you just like chose like a certain clip part or whatever, but um, I wanted to know if she got like if she went into depth with like her like you know transition and stuff like that because I feel like today you know our world has come so far like society has come so far with like um, the LG the LGBT big community and stuff like that because I was interviewing her I didn't see it wasn't super necessary for me to like ask her questions I sort of already knew the answer to but I think that something that's interesting about that would be that Donald who you know was like her principal human connection that I tried to frame the story around with her um, when she met Donald she was like a boy basically and then with him was like with his encouragement and support and love, was able to like sort of in her 20s become a different sort of person, and then later, like, lo like lost that man or whatever that was uh, sort of a rock. And um, so, the way that a, a trans every trans woman's story for how they get through that is like totally different. And I, it, she does go into it a little bit, but it was it was like sort of a thing that was done under the care of another person, basically, with another human being, so, um, yeah. Yeah. 
She's like, both of my kids are in college, like, I did it. And, like, I feel like, there, I know, like, there's a lot of kids that aren't, you know, as privileged as I am to be here. Like, there's kids that are probably sitting in shelters with their moms, and their moms don't know what to do. And, like, um, I feel like there could have been, you know, better people to interview. Where, like, I know it's scary to go to these places where some of these people live, but there's someone out there that wants to know that there's someone out there like them. Like, they're going to sit and see, you know, like, okay, he has his own business, how do I get there? Like, you know, like, obviously their parents can't guide them from their country. Maybe my, my mom's parents were dead by like 2002. So she had, you know, no light in her life. I knew it was just us two. And um, with me and my younger brother. And I feel like, you know, there's kids who, you know, like are in the transgender community that don't know what the hell to do. Like, they're completely lost in their life. Like. Um, like my brother is gay and I love him and I support him so much and God forbid the society takes the wrong foot and he just, you know, I don't have him anymore. Like God forbid that happens. But like, these are people that should use their platform to assist, you know, the people that don't have that support. Where I, I know, like I see on Twitter every day, there's just someone just loses their life because they don't have that support. And I just want these people to appropriately use their platform to assist these people in their darkness immigrants, you know, like, and I'm not even saying Spanish immigrants, what about the Caribbean people that come here, you know, the people on Flatbush, you know, like, one day Flatbush is probably not going to be filled with Caribbean people one day, maybe they're going to get pushed out, and it's the people that you see sleeping in the trains, on the streets, like, what's their story, no one wants to talk to them, why? Like, why does no one want to hear, like, what this homeless guy has to say, maybe he's not homeless because of drugs, maybe he was misplaced, where else are they supposed to go, like, they lose everything, and completely everything, like money, jobs, and then you try to like, you don't want to give them two dollars, get a job. What address are they supposed to report to if they don't have one? And like, think about it, there's no empty spaces left in New York. Everything is taken. Where are they left to go? Homeless shelters, imagine like, it was really hard for me to get a job like the first two months because I want to support my mom. And I, I can only imagine how hard it is for them. Like, it's not that easy. And I feel like, you know, like, we should stop overlooking people because, you know, Maybe they're, you know, like, they're at a lesser status than us. We should, as privileged college students, you know, extend the hand and be like, here, let me try to, you know, project your voice into someone that can actually make a change. And I'm, like, I'm glad that I come here because I think the kids here are, like, really woke, I would say. <laughs> and they just kind of know what's going on. Like, if someone, like, God forbid, someone says them, like, slander out there about gay people, like, I think everyone on the street would lose their mind here. Like. I'm from Pennsylvania, I'd be like, yeah, like, you know, that kid is, you know, the F word. I'd be like, whoa, like, we're not doing that here. I'm sorry. And I feel like these people, like, I know they're still trying to work on themselves, but now that they are, like, you know, at the top of, you know, where they were before, like, they should voice, like, be like, hey, I was, I'm transgender. Stop, you know, like, help these kids. Like, these are people, too. Immigrants are people, too. And, like, they play a part in America as much as documented people do. And uh, I just I think the listening project is looking for students. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think there's a place for you to 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 ask all these questions and talk to all these people and collect and all of you, right? Yeah, to collect right. all these stories <laughs> and to yeah. and to and to do it. I, I I don't want any of us to feel like we don't have a place to That's do okay. such work. Either we make it, we write it, we record it. We create it, or we join projects and efforts already doing it. And, and so I think there's a lot of room for everything that you said. And Absolutely. Really well, I will yeah. say Professor Part has really sparked a fire. Like, in my soul. Oh. like I would sit in my room and I'm just like, like I look at like I was in Brooklyn. Like I don't, I wasn't raised here. I was raised in Queens, and then we moved to Pennsylvania. And like I just see how different it looks, and I'm just like, this is not fair. And I see homeless people, and I'm like, that's not fair. Yeah. And then I wait, I see the people that treat, and I'm like, that's not fair either. And it's like, 
what do I do? And then we were talking about gentrification and redlining and how like there's specific hotspots for cops and it's all communities that can't get out of where they are. And I just feel like now that we're talking about it, I'm kind of glad I'm here because like there's people that actually can get out of it. And I feel like it should be projected more than talking about like, ooh, the Trump's went golfing. No, let's hear about how <laughs> Justine made it to the freaking top from the Philippines. Like let's hear about how Mark came from, you know, DR, which is very like heavy poverty there and is here like living the dream. Like you can do it too. Like we I think the media should feed people more, you know, helpful guidance rather than the Trump's golfing in Cuba. Like no one cares. <laughs> Thank you. students all like dash to their next class. <laughs> I wanted to um, uh, turn to you, Edwidge, and uh, for any thoughts or questions you might have or comments. If you want, whatever you feel, yeah. I don't want to have my I know, it's, we should be in one big circle, right? Yeah. With the, yeah. Good morning. I want to thank Maddie and Jessica and, um, and all of you. This was so wonderful to, to see and share and I jotted down some notes that I'll, that I'll just share uh, with you. Uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote a book called um, Create Dangerously, The Immigrant Artist at Work. And one of the reasons I wanted to write it was to find out, it wasn't necessarily an all history, but I wanted to find <coughs> out how a certain artist came to be what they are. And one of the people I talked to was a, a journalist from Haiti called Daniel Morel, who photographed some of the most brutal scenes that happened, you know, in, in the 90s in Haiti and throughout, and his photographs were all often f extremely violent and people would criticize him. And, and then when I started interviewing him, I found out that when he was uh, 13, he was, uh, there was a going to be a public execution in Port-au-Prince in a cemetery, and his school uh, and all the school children were brought to the cemetery to watch the execution, and he was there and after the man was executed, his glasses fell off and he took the glasses home and then the next day, there were pictures of all the, the execution all over town to scare people and Danielle was, he had been at the execution and he walked by the pictures and then he realized that, oh, this is what I want to do, but I want to do it for good. You know, I want to take those kinds of photographs, I want to bear witness. And so knowing somebody's journey by talking to them in conversation is something that I've always tried to do in my work, whether it ends up in an essay or with, like it did in, in this essay that I wrote about Danielle and Create Dangerously. So I thought that that journey of making those connections is so very um, important. And I was thinking about that when I was um, watching um, uh, Radic uh, the f your first Radica's um, uh, presentation about, about Preeti and something you said about immigrant artists, how our origins always connected to that work in the sense of trying to uh, recreate it. And then of course when um, Dominic was talking about Mark Torres, one of the things that struck me was the nuance of that situation. Because I also grew up under a dictatorship and it's so complex and the people uh, you know, you think are, are like devils or sometimes very complicated. I met a man a couple of years ago who was at this execution, an older man. And he said, you know, and he was a, 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 a very upstanding man in the community. You know, he fed orphans in Haiti, he had orphanages. And then I was at a reading for this book, Create Dangerously, which had Danielle's story in it. And he walks up to me and he said, you know, I want you to know that I was there that day at the execution. I didn't, I wasn't one of the people who fired on th these guys, but I was there. And, and he said, did you know that even if we twinged, like, if it seemed like we were going to not shoot, like we would be shot. And, and I had never thought of that from, you know, from his perspective. So I think that's also one of the things that talking to somebody and doing these oral histories is the nuance of a situation. Because you could say, like he was saying, you know, my mom was rolling with the dictator's son. And that's probably something you couldn't say on the island, <laughs> right? Like, because you would be classified a certain way. But I think he was also brave of him to say that because what you need are truth tellers when you do these projects, people who are willing to be, to be uh, vulnerable. And Zoe, I liked uh, what that Justine wasn't just, a, you know, it wasn't, I don't want to say just, but that there were so many layers to Justine than just 
being a trans woman, that she was a fiction writer, that she's fabulous fashionista, and, and that you brought that, all of that out. I think that's also a way to complicate narratives. So we're not just like, you know, like everybody wants the juicy details about somebody's transition, but that's not all that person is, you know? So I, I for me, I really love that, that they were so, you know, and also the stuff about the, the background there, I thought was um, amazing. And throughout all of yours, I loved hearing the encouraging grunts in <laughs> and encouragement, which are the really great tell signs of listening, I think. Because the trick of, you know, especially when you're hearing a very fascinating story is that you want to like jump in and, and ask the questions. But you were, in, at least in what I heard, was a um, very, very good listener. And The Art of Death, which with you mentioned that Justine was reading, is a book I feel like is a, also a kind of all history about my mother's final days. And I tried to put everything that she told me, you know, in, in this earth, um, you know, on, in her last moments in, in the book. And we talked a little bit about Jasmine's and the complexity of telling stories where the person does not want to be identified, where literally someone is coming out of the shadows, which goes back to what um, you were saying about um, finding better people whose stories to tell. And I think we have to so try to avoid that sort of what about is um, and, and who is better and what narratives are more important because every story matters. Every story matters and um, we, don't, we never know the full story of people until we are told these stories. And, and some voices are missing because some people can't afford to come into the light. It's not every undocumented person who's going to want to talk to you because they have to protect themselves from their immigration status. They have to, you know, it's not very, it's not very easy. And um, Jasmine, your interview story reminded me of a short story that I wrote called um, New York Day Women. And I wrote it when I was at Barnard College because I was going to college, like you were saying, I was going to this, you know, very prestigious institution. My mother had made it through very little schooling, you know, like, scrape to, to start high school. And then I would see these women who were pushing other people's children around the campus. And I always wondered about their children because my, I was in Haiti while my mom was here working. She wasn't, she wasn't a nanny, she worked in a factory. But I would always transpose, I would always see these women and I was, who were raising this whole generation of faculty children. And, and I always thought about, about their children. So that was, um, your piece resonated for me in that way because the only time we hear about nannies really is we see them all the time. Like when I'm, when I was t would spend summers here with with my kids, we would go to there was like a, a nanny thing, you, like a you would look up what to do around, and then it would be a maybe a couple of moms, but you know the rest of them were people nannies from all over the world. But the only time we hear from nannies or about nannies is when they kill some children <laughs> or, you know, and that's like the extreme uh, situation or when people ask themselves about immigration, they say, like, oh, who's gonna take care of our, of our children? But I would, recommend to, I would recommend to you, I don't know, I'm sure Jessica, had, you might have talked about it, Stud Sterkel, who is a great oral historian who did exactly what you were saying, who told the story of, of ordinary people, everyday people, throughout and he did it for you know for uh, decades and has a wonderful archives where he would talk to people about their lives about the you know and whether it was sort of a sensational story or just the most ordinary story again because um, people matter stories matter every story um, matters and we can't underestimate that so when people ask like what taught you to be a writer I always say it's the storytellers in my in my family and, and in the African tradition, we have a person called a griot, you know, uh, and it's um, not to be confused with Haitian griot, which is a pork dish, but, <laughs> but it's, uh, people often say it in, in, in English, I'll say a griot, but it's spelled G-I-R-O-T. And that person is like a living library. And I'm sure you all have one of those people in your lives. So that's the other thing I would encourage you to, to turn to, you know, these stories in your own life. And sometimes we can, you know, underestimate the value of our parents' struggle. We may not even know it, or they might be very reluctant to talk about it. 
So I would encourage you to do that as well because you know, to, to try to get those stories from the people close to your life, especially if there's an immigration experience, there's a struggle, because I think that's a valuable tool in terms of learning from the past for the generations to come even in your own family. So watching these and listening to your conversation makes me feel like you guys are the griots now. And whether you feel like there's stories that haven't been told, that they're uh, lacunas, they're, they're missing gaps, it's your, you know, you have probably the best tools available, <laughs> you know, in this day and age to do it. And I would certainly encourage you to do it, not only for your own, um, to satisfy your own curiosity, but to contribute to like a, a wealth, a kind of treasure trunk, a bank of knowledge that will serve everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edwige, and thank you to everybody. Thanks for this wonderful session. Now let's like, go do our days.